remain muted until our question and answer at the end. Thank you for being with us. And Laura Burns, please introduce our session today. Right, it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Nagy. Um, uh, she was a director emerita, she's two minutes now, and she's a director emerita of the University of Florida Harn Museum of Art, uh, which she directed from 2002 to 2018. And under her leadership, the museum added an 18,000 square foot wing with galleries for contemporary art in 2005 and a 26,000 square foot wing for Asian art in 2012. Um, throughout her career, uh, uh, Dr. Nagy has curated exhibitions and published an incredible number of articles and exhibition catalogs about med medieval, contemporary, and African art. And um, while at the Horn, she co-organized the exhibit, some of you may have seen called Continuity and Change, Three Generations of Ethiopian Artists in 2007. Um, she also worked with an international uh, curatorial team from the Harn and the Royal Museum from Central Africa in Belgium um, to organize the traveling exhibition, Congo Across the Waters. That was, that was in 2014. Uh, until recently, she served as editor for the scholarly journal, African Arts. And in fall of 2019, she served as interim director of the Leichner Museum in St. Augustine, which is a Gilded Age Museum of History and Art. Um, that prior to her appointment as director of the Harn, uh, Nagy spent 17 years at the North Carolina Museum of Art in Raleigh, Raleigh, where she served as curator of African art and associate director of education. She was also an adjunct faculty member at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And in the 1980s, she was a lecturer at the Cleveland Museum of Art, where she also organized an exhibition of medieval textiles and taught at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, and uh, Dr. Nagy uh, received her doctorate of art from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Uh, and I'll just say during her years in Gainesville, she has been extremely active both in the field of art and in the wider community. Um, for instance, she served as a trustee of the Association of Art Museum Directors and president of the Florida Art Museum Directors Association was on the boards of the Florida Association of Museums, the Art Councils of African Studies Association, the Matheson History Museum, the Gainesville Area Chamber of Commerce, the Gainesville Women's Forum, and the Rotary Club of Gainesville. So <laughs> <laughs> it goes on and on. She's a peer reviewer uh, um, of the Accreditation Commission of the American Alliance of Museums. Um, in 2019, um, Dr. Nagy moved to Tampa to join her husband, Dr. Paul Nagy, who is Vice President for Strategic Planning and Analysis at Hillsborough Community College. Um, and in uh, Tampa, she continues her involvement in art and community organizations. Uh, for, for instance, she serves on the Urban Design Committee from the Downtown Tampa Association and the Advisory Committee to the Hillsborough Community College Art Galleries. Um, she's also active in Rotary there and uh, does pro bono cons cons uh, consulting for the Henry B. Plant Museum at the University of Tampa. And I could keep going on, but I'm gonna turn it over <laughs> to Rebecca now <laughs> and she can let her do some talking. So, <laughs> Thank you, Laura. That was very thorough and generous. I appreciate all that, all that nice uh, background on what I've been up to. Now I'm gonna share my screen and we'll see if my instructions from Julianne are working for me. There it is. All right. Now, some full pictures for you. Slideshow, come on. I'm beginning. There we go. Now I've got to shrink all you beautiful people so I won't see you in front of my slides. There we go. Okay. So um, today I'm going to talk to you about one of the most popular and beloved pieces in the Horn Museum of Art, El Anatsui's Old Man's Cloth. You see that sculpture here and we'll come back to another image of it in a few minutes when I'll tell you more about it specifically. 
But um, this all came about because two of your um, members and participants in the ILR, Margaret Boonstra and Laura Burns, invited me to come and talk to you about how it came to be that the Harn Museum of Art acquired this beautiful sculpture that hangs on the wall in the contemporary galleries at the Harn. And um, we were able to do this very early on in the artist upward trajectory as an international superstar. If we had waited till now to try to buy a, a work by Elinatsui, we couldn't afford it because they go for in the neighborhood of a million dollars. So we got into the act early and uh, Margaret has always been excited about this when she would travel to other museums around the country. She would uh, send me information about having seen work by Ella Natsui in these other major museums. And she kept saying, I'm just so impressed and so amazed that the Harn has one of these pieces. So um, she's been a fan of his work for a long time. And then she uh, read an article in, let's see if I can get this, there we go. Um, she read this article in the New Yorker recently, and here's a reference to that article because some others of you might like to look it up. I found it online. Um, hopefully you can still find it readily online. Uh, Julian Lucas, the author of this article, gave a very thorough and insightful and well-illustrated overview of Ellen Natsui's career um, and how he came to be as renowned and widely represented in the art world as he is today. And this uh, image, this beautiful portrait of Elinatsui at his studio in Insuka, Nigeria, was um, featured in that article. So um, I did draw from this article some for my talk today, and I'll share another important uh, resource if you want to read more about the artist um, as I go along. So Margaret saw this article, and that gave her the idea that maybe it would be a good time to ask me to come and speak to the ILR about Elle's work and how the Horn acquired a major piece by him. She mentioned this to Laura Burns, the two of them teamed up to uh, reach out to me and invite me to speak. I was delighted to do so because um, I know so many of you. I've spoken to the ILR before in person over the years. Only regret that I can't be with you in person today, but Zoom is our next best alternative uh, during this time of, we hope, a fading pandemic. I had been following Ella Natsui's work for a number of years. I first heard about, saw his work, and met him in person in 1997. That was when an exhibition at the National Museum of African Art, Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC, was um, hosted called The Poetics of Line, Seven Artists of the Insuka Group. This is the a copy of the catalog to that exhibition. In uh, conjunction with the exhibition, the National Museum of African Art hosted a symposium for a couple of days where they invited the seven artists featured in this exhibition to come to the museum and present lectures about their work. They were great. I enjoyed all of them, but honestly, and I don't just I don't think this is just selective memory. I think I really was most impressed with Ella Natsui's talk. Um, he was not talking about metal cloth style sculptures because he had not started making those yet at this time. They had not even entered his mind at this time. Instead, he was known for um, the work that he had been doing up to this point. And that was in two um, mediums. One was, um, sculpture, ceramic sculpture, such as this piece, Gebeze from 1979, and wood sculpture. And I'll, I'll show you an example of this wood sculpture in a moment. As I remember his lecture, what impressed me most, however, was his description and the images he showed of a performance piece that he did when he had a residency in Germany. It was not a permanent work of art. It was a performance or happening on the beach where he um, created an environment and then interacted with the environment. And 
the way he described it and the images he showed, it was very evocative and very poetic and mysterious. And I was quite smitten with it. Um, but I did also very much his, uh, enjoy the work that he showed us and what was in the exhibition. So when he was doing these ceramic pieces, he was um, already teaching at the University of Nigeria in Suka, which is at, in the southern part of Nigeria in a region inhabited by uh, primarily Igbo people. The Igbo people are known in Nigeria as being very um, well-educated and intellectual. Um, just to give you one example, a fellow professor at the university in Nsuka was Chinua Achebe. I think that name will be familiar to many of you as a literary figure. He, he died a few years ago, but Chinua Achebe wrote, wrote the very famous novel, Things Fall Apart, as well as some other wonderful novels. I recommend his writings to you, but he was one of Elle's um, friends there. And forgive me for using his first name, but I do know him and I've encountered him and visited with him over the years. And it's just so much easier to say than Ellen Atsui every time I want to uh, mention him. Um, so the way he made these ceramic sculptures is indicative of the way he has worked throughout his career. Very experimental, mainly abstract, and reusing found materials, materials that had some other previous use and existence. In this case, he used um, pot sherds, so fragments of other pots that had been used and broken. And he would collect the pot sherds, grind them up into a powder, uh, form that into a matrix. He mixed that with manganese, a metallic uh, mineral that um, has a silvery gray tonality. And then he would form these into these convoluted and folded um, abstract uh, forms that slightly remember, uh, resemble the form of a vessel, but really they're, they're very abstract and very uh, non-functional. That was unusual at the university in Nsuka at the time, which had a much more traditional British-based um, art curriculum that focused on figurative sculpture, paintings of human figures, still lifes and landscapes. So he was really pushing the envelope doing this kind of abstract work, uh, even in these um, ceramic pieces in his early career. The next medium that he worked with was wood. And again, when L was working with wood, he would use found objects. The first wood sculptures that he used were wooden trays that he would pick up in the markets in Nsuka. If you've ever been to Africa, uh, many parts of the continent, or if you've you know, seen films or just images, you've seen the wooden trays balanced on women's heads in the markets and they do this amazing feat of walking with wooden trays piled with eggs or peanuts or, you know, water bottles or any number of things that you can't imagine balancing on your head. So he, he liked to use materials that had some previous associations in life and that had passed through many people's hands and had that human history attached to them. So he would take these wooden trays and burn images into them with heated rods. He would route, use routers to um, engrave them. He would um, use um, blow torches on them and create designs on them and, and hang them on the wall. So those were his earliest wood pieces. Then he started using discarded borders that um, women in their household used to grate uh, cassava and, uh, and grains for food, their uh, mortars and pestles, and these mortars were wood. So he loved that association with prior use. This particular piece though was um, different. He made this in Brazil in 1992. He was invited to a UN climate summit in um, Brazil. During this summit, he went up into a city in northern Brazil in the rainforest called Manaus. And Manaus is home to a Amazonian research institute where they study environmental issues in, in, in the Amazon. While he was there, he found this felled tree and decided to make a sculpture out of that tree, the trunk of the tree. He spent many weeks engraving these uh, intricate designs onto it with heated rods. You can see the black designs, I think, in the slide. And after he had done all that work, then he took a chainsaw 
to the piece. And um, here he is attacking it with a chainsaw and just kind of destroyed his own work. So um, it was sort of, uh, rather shocking for the other people watching him do this, but he was very interested in um, the processes of creation and destruction and recreation and um, some of the environmental issues related to the rainforest that were being um, discussed at that summit. This piece was featured um, in the Insuka exhibition at the National Museum of African Art and then acquired by them for their permanent collection. So then we come to the cloth sculptures. Um, in 1998, and uh, El, this has almost become legendary, uh, people always ask El Anatsui what gave him the idea for creating cloth-like sculptures out of pieces of metal. And he said, well, um, I just was taking a walk in, in Suka, Nigeria, as I, he likes to take long walks. And while he's walking, he always looks around to see what kinds of materials he can find that might be interesting to use for his art. He found a bag of bottle tops. And I'll show you a picture of the type of bottle tops uh, he uses in a few minutes, but um, these were from liquor bottles mainly. And these were liquors that were produced in Nigeria and they had all kinds of interesting graphic, uh, you know, the names of the liquor companies and such on them. And um, he took this bag of bottle tops home back to his studio at the university and just put it to the side. And for a couple of years, he did not do anything with them until the early 2000s, he decided to um, see what he could come up with to make use of that interesting aluminum. So I first found out about this from a colleague at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, Elspeth Court, who was following Elle's work as I had been doing. Um, she saw an exhibit of his work at October Gallery in London. October Gallery is a prominent contemporary gallery. Um, they show work by international artists and they've become um, Elle's dealer in London since then. Um, in 2002, they showed two wonderful sculptures called Man's Cloth and Woman's Cloth. Not old man's cloth, that's our piece, but man's cloth and woman's cloth. And um, those were snapped up immediately in 2002 by the British Museum. Several years later, um, the October Gallery showed another exhibit of Ill's work called Gawu. And um, they had a postcard that looked sort of like this image to advertise the show. And it looked like this beautiful cloth made out of metal was draped over some bushes. It may have been draped over a, you know, sawhorses or something like that, but it, it looked like it was draped over the bushes. And my friend Elspeth Court um, sent me that postcard and she said, look at this amazing work. You've got to see this. Well, I didn't have a chance to go to London at the time, but <laughs> sadly, but I showed the postcard to our curator of African art, um, Susan Cooksey, and uh, suggested that we should look into this. So Susan also liked the work a lot from what she could see. And she contacted October Gallery in London to learn more about this exhibition called Elanatsui Gawu. Gawu is a word in the Ewe language of Ghana, E-W-E. -E. The Ewe people live in Southern Ghana along the coast. And that's where El was originally, originally from. He's Ewe and Ghanaian himself. So um, she contacted October Gallery and found out that this exhibition was actually organized by a gallery in Wales called the Oriel Mostyn Gallery, and that it had been traveling around um, several museums in the UK. Susan amazingly arranged to have the exhibition at the Harn. So in 2005, we became the first museum in the United States, not only to host the exhibition Gawu, which means metal cloak, as I mentioned, but also um, to acquire one of these cloth sculptures by Elanatsui. It so happens that old man's cloth, the one in the horn, was the third one he made. So the first two, man's cloth and woman's cloth, ended up in the British Museum. 
And the third one in the series, Old Man's Cloth, ended up in the Harn Museum of Art. Um, so we, we were very fortunate to, to be able to follow the uh, example of the British Museum and um, grab one of those pieces while we could. Ellen Otsui came to the Harn. He spent about, um, I think it was about 10 days with us to work with our preparators and with Susan Cooksey to install Gawu. He also met with students at the art school while he was here. He said, he's a great teacher. I'll come back to his role as a teacher at the end of my talk. And he loves working with students and engaging with, with students and young artists. Here, Elle is standing at, in the horn um, with this piece called Peak Project. This piece preceded the metal cloth sculptures. This was made in 1999. It came about because once again, on one of his walks around in Suka, he found a bag of lids from milk cans. The name of the uh, piece, I'm sure relates to the fact that these look like elongated peaks, but it's also a pun, it's a play on words because the name of the evaporated milk from which these lids came, the, the cans, the, the company is called Peak. So it was peak evaporated milk imported from Holland to Insuka, very popular in West Africa, known to everyone. So when people saw these milk can lids and saw the name Peak Project, they would know exactly what the double meaning of, of that term is relating to the form of the sculpture and also to the company. Um, now, he, he did the same thing with these milk lids can lids that he does with the pieces for the cloth sculptures. He pierced them and then stitched them together with copper wire and created sheets of these uh, lids. And then the sheets of lids were rather flexible because of the way they're stitched together. And then he could form them into any shape he wants. One of the things that L says about his work is that he really likes unfixed forms. In other words, there's no specific way the pieces have to be shaped or installed. It's really up to the curator at a museum or gallery and the installers, the preparators, as to exactly how they shape the piece and configure it. If he's there, he may weigh in on that, but if he's not there, hands off. And uh, then you hope if he comes to visit, he'll be pleased with what you've done. But he likes that element of having um, a lot of creative people involved in the process of creation of the final presentation. This is another piece that was in the Harns show uh, in Gawu called Crumbling Wall, again, preceding the metal cloth sculptures. He was working once again with found materials. In this case, it's cassava graters Cassava graters appeal to um, El Anatsui because of their association with everyday life, their previous use, all the human hands through which they've passed. And another aspect of his work um, that he talks about is transforming an everyday material into a work of art. So he does not like the word recycling. To El, recycling means that you reuse something for another practical purpose. So you recycle plastic to melt it down and make something else out of plastic that can be used. To him, he's not recycling, but he's repurposing is a word we sometimes use in the US, but he likes transforming uh, the work into something uh, aesthetic and beautiful and inspiring a work of art. So cassava graters are made out of um, oil drums that um, people, flatten out and cut rectangular forms out of them, clean them and sterilize them, and then punch uh, holes in them with nails and use that grater to grate cassava, the root vegetable that's so popular in Nigeria and other parts of Africa. So uh, then when they get tired of them or they're worn out, they cast them aside and they rust and become very interesting <laughs> patinated uh, pieces of metal that he can, again, stitch together with copper wire and configure in different ways, in this case, into a monumental wall. Um, the piece was installed in the rotunda at the Harn, but here you see it in another museum that hosted Gawu at Dartmouth. In that exhibition, Gawu, there were, my memory's 
failing me, but I think there were three cloth uh, sculptures. Old man's cloth, the one we acquired, there was definitely a black one, almost all black, that was very dramatic, had just a little bit of color in it. It was even bigger than old man's cloth, which by the way, is about 16 feet high and about 17 feet wide. Um, we thought about getting the black one. <laughs> and I wonder what you would think about that. It's very beautiful, but very somber. And it is that we kind of associated it with mourning and funerals in Ghana. Uh, but probably for the best, we decided to get this piece that's very colorful. And I think you can see even in this image how many pieces are um, stitched together with copper wire to create this cloth type sculpture. When L speaks of a man's cloth or an old man's cloth, he's talking about these references, these very large um, handwoven cloths or frequently handwoven that men in Ghana wear in a toga-like fashion. Um, the most familiar and famous ones from Ghana are kente cloths um, that are very colorful. And it happens um, that in um, Elanatsui's region of Ghana, the Ewe region, kente cloth is widely produced using cotton. Another major center of kente cloth production is up in the Ashanti region in central Ghana, uh, where Kumasi, the, the capital of the Ashanti region is located. And there they make it out of silk or rayon, so it's a different shiny texture there. But um, El's father was a weaver, other relatives of his were weavers. Now, interestingly, what he says about this is that he did not think of it in terms of a cloth or anything to do with kente cloth until he had already made it. So he had these pieces of metal. He um, found these you know, bottle caps by the side of the road. And um, after having them around the studio for a couple of years, he decided to try flattening them out. So he separated the, the top, the round part from the part that wraps around the neck of the bottle and um, pierced some holes in them and started attaching them together with copper wire. At this time, he was doing the work himself. He only had a couple of assistants very labor intensive, slow, tedious work. You can make about a square foot of these stitched together pieces in a full work day. So it's been estimated that even if you had five or six people creating these square blocks of um, attached metal pieces, it would take several months to create a sculpture like Old Man's Cloth. And here's what the people, uh, the pieces look like when they've been separated and flattened out and stitched together with copper wire. So after he did all this and saw the finished work, um, you know, assembled these blocks into a larger piece and he didn't hang it on the wall at that point, he draped it outside over, initially over some bushes and then over a kind of uh, two by four framework that he and his assistants made outside his studio. Then he thought, oh, it looks like kind of like kente cloth. And uh, part of the association is the colors, um, the red, black, gold, and silver. But that was accidental because that's just the colors that were in the bottle caps. So he didn't really choose those, that color palette. It was dictated by the bottle caps and what colors were available to him. The backs of the aluminum bottle caps are silver. So that's where the silver comes from. And the other colors are on the front side where the name of the company is often stamped. And sometimes you can read that in the finished work. So when L talks about his work and here you can see the scale as it is shown on the wall of the horn uh, during a museum nights uh, talk by one of our docents, um, he says, you know, he loves the found materials, transforming them into something beautiful and meaningful, um, letting the material influence the work of art. So the material helps dictate what you can make from it and how it will look and act. Um, he also speaks of unfixed form. It's a phrase he uses a lot, which is a reference to the fact that um, he does not dictate how you're going to install it 
The harm could pile this up on the floor if they wanted to, and he would be fine with that, or they could drape it over an easel and he would be fine with that. Um, the first time he ever saw these hung on the wall was at October Gallery in 2002, when the director of the gallery decided to hang them on the wall. What Elle does prefer with these cloth sculptures is that you not just hang it flat, that you give it volume by draping it and, and creating these folds in the, in the metal fabric. Also, after the fact, he thought about how liquor plays into the history of West Africa in particular <clears throat> as part of colonial trade, um, as a commodity that was um, traded by Europeans when they came to Africa and uh, then within the country and the continent. But um, also, you know, it's sad association with the slave trade and that aspect of uh, trade between Europe and Africa and the Americas. But these are all associations that came to him after the fact, after he had played with the material that he found so promising. Now, one thing I love to do is brag about the horn. Um, and I tell um, Leanne Chesterfield, the new director of the horn, who's doing with her team a, a fantastic job there, um, that I'm now the chief cheerleader for the horn. Uh, in retirement. And I like to brag about the fact that um, Susan Cooksey arranged to bring Galru to the Horn before anyone else in the US had even thought of it. So look at the dates here. The, the exhibition traveled around the UK for a couple of years. Then it came to the Horn in 2005. People took note, curators from around the country took notice. Some of them came to the Horn to visit and saw the the uh, installation. And then it's, you know, got picked up by other museums, but it was a couple of years later that it traveled to the Hood at Dartmouth, um, then the Fowler at UCLA, the University of Arizona Museum of Art in Tucson, and ended up at the National Museum of African Art in DC. And over the years, those museums also acquired works by L, as did other museums um, in the US. Here's another great you know, opportunity to brag about the horn. This um, quote that's highlighted or a section of the quote is from an article that was featured in African Arts in 2008 by uh, Lisa Binder, an African arts scholar. Um, African Arts is the premier journal of African art in the US. It's published at UCLA um, and Lisa was talking about museums that in 2008 had acquired work by the horn, by the, by Elinatsui. And she mentions the horn first, I like that, little nod to the fact that we were the first to get one of those metal cloth sculptures. And then the de Young in San Francisco, and she mentions the British Museum in London and the Centre Pompidou in Paris. So um, we were in very august company at that point as early collectors of Elinatsui's metal cloth sculptures. Um, and we also, Robin Pointer and I were kind of uh, patting ourselves on the shoulder, Professor Pointer, about the fact that um, she didn't have to say the Samuel P. Horn Museum of Art at the University of Florida, just as she didn't have to say the de Young Museum in San Francisco, California, because she knew that everyone reading African arts would know all about the Horn and they would know exactly who she was talking about. Another publication that I want to commend to you and encourage you, if you're interested in knowing more about El Anatsui, um, to have a look at, um, and I think I found this on Amazon, it's, it's a very new publication, second edition of the book by a renowned Africanist art historian, Susan Fogel, El Anatsui Art and Life. This is a massive book, uh, lavishly illustrated, but very reasonably priced, I think at about $50. Um, and the first edition was published in 2012, but um, this is a 2020 edition, which she felt like she needed to um, revise and expand because Elle had been so active and has been doing so much interesting new work in the intervening years. I want to give Susan Fogel credit, not only for a lot of the information that I've gathered on uh, El Anatsui's more recent works, but also some of the images I'm showing you are lifted from her book, uh, such as this one of El in Nsuka, Nigeria, at the Recycling Center 
where he's a frequent visitor to see what kind of interesting materials he can find there. Um, just to show you another uh, cloth sculpture, um, and you can see how varied they can be depending on the color palette. Um, this one is called Red Block because it's a reference not only to the color, but to the blocks of um, metal cloth that uh, Ellen and his assistants would put together to make one of these larger pieces. <clears throat> and the, uh, this one was acquired by the Broad Art Foundation in Los Angeles. It had a partner, <laughs> a, a, another uh, matching or uh, a, a, another piece that went with it called Black Cloth a black block, I'm sorry, black block, which is now in the Brooklyn Museum of Art. So he made these two in 2010. And um, the way he makes these cloth sculptures now, he has many assistants. Uh, he keeps adding assistants to his studio, uh, 30 or 40 now at any given time. And in, um, in Suka, he also has recently opened a second studio in Ghana in Tema, which is the port city near the capital of Accra, and um, lots of assistance in each of those locations. Um, Susan Fogel in her book uh, counted a section of this piece and then multiplied and estimated that there are 15,000 uh, separate small pieces of metal making up this, this sculpture. So in Elf's studios, he has his assistants lay out the blocks on the floor of the studio and he gets on a ladder or he has a little balcony he can get on in the studio and uses a laser pointer to direct them and say, oh, especially if it's a, a multicolored uh, piece, you know, please move that block over here, move that one over here. And he sort of composes the work from the metal blocks. He does not use preparatory drawings for these. It's much more spontaneous. And he loves the fact that lots of hands are involved in the creation process. More recently, he's, um, well, this is the same year, but he's continued to um, experiment with other shapes. So not restricting himself to the rectangular format of a cloth, such as a man in Ghana might wrap around himself toga style, but also um, other irregular forms, such as this one, which might remind us of a cloud or some other shape. Um, I was struck in this piece by how dense it looks how heavy, these pieces are not really heavy because the aluminum that he uses is very light and very flexible and very fragile, but it looks so dense and, and heavy because of um, the way the pieces were shaped from which this beautiful uh, a memo or a mask of humankind is made. And here you see it um, installed in an exhibition at the Akron Museum of Art. Here are some of the shapes of the pieces El uses for his work. So um, the one on the right is called flower, the flower shape, where the pieces of metal are it, it, they're folded in on themselves to create a dense, somewhat three-dimensional little flower-like, rosette-like piece. And that's what a memo was made of. So it gives it that density, that thickness uh, and, and uh, voluptuousness of the form. Notice also the one up on the left, that's upper left, that's called singlet, that's very open and transparent. Um, and he uses that when he wants a piece to have transparent uh, sections or an entire uh, sheet of transparent metal. Here's an example um, from 2010 and since about this time, Ilanatsui has been commissioned and has been doing a lot of pieces that are not just wall pieces or floor pieces, but creating an entire environment and installation piece in a large architectural uh, space where the visitor can walk around and interact among the pieces and really experience them spatially. So here you have these transparent like sheets hanging down, but also look on the right, this very shaggy, <laughs> layered, irregular um, assemblage of metal pieces that no longer resembles a piece of cloth at all. It's become something quite different. So he's really experimenting in interesting ways with, with different forms. He started doing these very monumental 
uh, pieces in 2007 when he was invited to be a featured artist at the Venice Biennale, um, major uh, contemporary art fair held in Venice every two years. The curator at the time, a New York-based art critic and curator, Robert Storr, invited him to do a big piece in the Arsenal, the major venue at the Venice Biennale, and then um, also to hang a huge piece on the facade of the Palazzo, um, I'm sorry, Palazzo Fortuny. So those pieces really grabbed the attention of curators um, and um, museum directors and collectors around the world. So since then, he's been, been creating these monumental sculptures for interiors and um, facades of buildings all over the world, in Japan, all over Europe, in the US, in Africa. Um, this piece, um, which has a subtitle, Searching for a Connection, is hanging here in 2013 on the facade of the Royal Academy in London. Maybe some of you have been there. Uh, it's a very historic institution where major artists uh, are elected to membership and they have exhibitions there and they um, have been very mm, straight laced and conservative for most of their history. Um, the Royal Academy was founded by King George III in 1768. The first president was Sir Joshua Reynolds, very um, academically trained and traditional portrait painter in uh, 18th century England. So for this um, institution now to break out a little bit and invite a major contemporary artist from former British colony, Ghana, lives in a, another former British colony in Nigeria to um, cover up the neoclassical facade of the Royal Academy with this monumental metal sculpture was quite surprising and wonderful. Um, the last thing I want to touch on in the last couple of minutes is how important Ellen Natsui has been in his academic career and as a teacher of other uh, promising art students and then a mentor to young artists and art historians and as they've continued their careers. Born in what was the Gold Coast at the time uh, in 1944, um, L was in a very, very large family. His father was very traditional, had several wives and lots of children. Um, but L's mother died when he was young and his father sent L to live with uh, an uncle who was a Presbyterian minister, uh, did not have multiple wives. <laughs> and um, with that uncle, he went to a Presbyterian school and graduated from high school there in Ketagana. Then he went to a major university in um, Ghana called KNUST for short, named after the first president of independent Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah. Got his BA in sculpture there and did postgraduate studies in Ordad. Then he was a lecturer for a few years in a, a town on coastal Ghana called Winaba before moving to Nigeria in 1975 to the University of Nigeria in Suka. He taught there for 36 years and had a profound influence on many, many art students and um, graduates. He only retired in 2011. And as I've mentioned, he has, has a studio there as well as a new one in Ghana. Here's an example of one of his uh, students' work. I just love this piece. So beautiful, so um, meaningful about environmental issues. This is Bright Ugochukwu Eke who now lives and teaches in California. I um, forget which university he's with, but um, Elle always encouraged his students to follow his example in the sense of using um, all kinds of different materials, mundane materials that they could find and around, um, as Elle has phrased it, whatever the environment throws up. So Brian, in this piece is using plastic bags filled with water and hanging them from the trees in um, an exhibition in Dakar, Senegal, in a Biennale there at Dakar. Um, these uh, bottles, uh, I mean bags of water, are very familiar to anyone who's traveled in Africa because vendors sell them on the streets. You can walk by or drive by or ride by on your motorcycle and just pay a vendor a few cents for a bag of water <laughs> and quench your thirst if you're so inclined. 
So he calls it acid rain, an obvious reference to the environment, which is very important in Bright at Kay's work. Um, I, I've been to Ghana many times to do research, and here um, in 2016, I was visiting the KNUST University in Kumasi, Ghana, with Susan Cooksey beside me, whom you, many of you know, um, our former graduate research assistant, Elisa Jordan, who's now on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania, and a group of the wonderful art faculty members from KNUST. Um, the last thing I'll show you is just a couple of examples of younger artists in Ghana who've been profoundly influenced by Elle in their choice of materials and um, in some cases by their um, form as well. So this is Ibrahim Mahama. I would guess Ibrahim's now getting close to 40. He's also an uh, internationally known artist and he uses jute bags. These jute bags were used originally for commodities like coffee beans and grains. And then later when they've been used for that, uh, people use them for hauling charcoal around, very humble like burlap, burlap sacks. The silvery look in the center of the cloth sculpture and the detail shows the little metal tags that are used on these bags as markers by the traders. Um, and then there's writing on them that comes from their use in the markets. So for Abraham, he's interested in capitalism, global markets, trade, um, the local markets in Ghana, the international aspects of trade, all, all these ideas are kind of behind his choice of material. But Elwood go, goes back, still does frequently to KNUST where he studied and um, does critiques and interacts with the young artist and encourages them and supports their work. Um, another artist, um, Serge Cloty, did not study at KNUST. He studied at another art school in Ghana, but he um, has been profoundly influenced by Ellen Atsui in his work. Um, here we are in his studio in Accra after a symposium in Accra on contemporary artists working there and they had a little field trip to his studio. Um, people in that audience include the lovely woman in the blue top and white skirt, Hannah O'Leary, who's a contemporary art specialist with Sotheby's, a curator from the Tate Modern, an art gallery owner from Marrakesh, and lots of other prominent um, art people who were talking to the young artist, Serge Cloty. His work, you can see, um, owes a big debt to Ellen Atsui's use of little pieces of material stitched together with metal wire. But in his case, there are pieces of plastic cut from uh, gallon jugs that are used to haul and store water in Ghana. And he does all kinds of interesting sculptures made from these sheets of um, stitched together plastic. The um, jugs that they're com they come from are called kufors in Ghana. It's a name, uh, kind of a, not a complimentary name, um, that comes from the name of the president of Ghana uh, at the time, Kufuor, when they had a major water crisis and the water utilities broke down and people didn't have a good source of water and they were having to hoard water and scrounge for water and they uh, kept it in these jugs uh, and they named them Kufors. Sometimes they're called jerry cans, um, but they're still used today. Um, people store water in them. And the job of uh, storing water and hauling water from the well or the shared uh, pump or whatever, the river, whatever source of water someone would be using, that always falls to the woman in the household. Um, and they had to haul these, these jugs around. So they're associated with uh, women and domestic work. This is a painting from the Harn Museum of Art and it's my last uh, piece I'll show you. This is called Oberi Bea by a young artist who did graduate from KNUST in Kumasi, Jeremiah Korshi. Um, he's not following Ella Natsui's uh, materials or styles, but he's kind of forging his own uh, very neo, uh, well, or let's see, hyper-realistic, photorealistic style of a portraiture. And this was from a series that he did called The Color of Water. So very much thinking about water and they had recently had another water shortage in 
a crop when the water utility broke down again. So everybody was thinking about water. And he did a whole series of portraits of women using these Khufu war jugs as a kind of throne. And each of these women had a different profession. Some of them were more traditional nurses, teachers, and so on. But this woman, Obiri Beya, who's a friend of the artist, works in the construction industry as evidenced by her hard hat. She's a quantity surveyor, uh, which means that um, her job is to determine how much they need to buy of steel, of concrete, of um, you know, sheetrock or whatever for the construction project. So she's got her measuring device there in her hand, indicative of her uh, part of the construction industry. Uh, she may not be obviously a woman at first glance. She does have earrings on, a uh, little, little hint of femininity there. But um, Susan Cooksey and I and our research assistant, Lisa, saw this at a, in a major exhibition of Jeremiah's, uh, Jeremiah's work in Accra and um, decided um, to propose it for acquisition at the Harn and happily the collections committee uh, agreed with us and we were able to add this to the collection. So I show this to you not only to emphasize how generous Elinatsui has been to go back to KNUST, his alma mater, and encourage the young artists working there or the recent graduates like Jeremiah, but also um, to point out the fact that the Horn is one of the major collecting centers in the US for contemporary African art, um, not only from Ghana, but from other parts of the continent. And at any given time, when you visit the contemporary galleries, as well as sometimes in the African art gallery or sometimes in the photography gallery, you'll see work by major contemporary artists from Africa. Some are very established, some are emerging. So I hope you'll go back to the Horn safe to go there now, they're taking all the right precautions, um, not only to see um, Elinatsui's old man's cloth, but also Obiri Bea and other works by contemporary artists. So thank you. And I think Julianne's going to um, take down the PowerPoint and I can then um, see if you have questions. Julianne, are you gonna kind of... Yeah. Uh, I was just unmuting, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Um, Laura, before I go to questions, you wanna make any comments? Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you so much for doing this, Rebecca. This is a joy. And uh, it was certainly, I was a, a docent for many years at the Harn and uh, going to see Old Man's Cloth was a must see when you were giving a, a tour for a group. Um, mm. And they all seem to just love it. Uh, I noticed that uh, recently, um, it's also been added on the list uh, of uh, artworks to study for uh, AP art courses uh, in high schools. And Ooh. yeah, and I know at least one group from this, while I was still a docent came through and it was on their list. So yeah. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that tells you something important. I, I'll just say one thing that I had not, that I learned that I hadn't appreciated even, I mean, you know, done it many times was was I had sort of assumed that he had started out uh, thinking that he was uh, doing kente cloth and this was sort of honoring it. Yeah. He was interested <laughs> in recycling and, 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 they, uh, uh, and that he also wanted to deal with the uh, slave trade. But from what you said, it's that's something that only came to him later. He was more interested mm -hmm. in playing with material in a play, right. that's, the right word, that's but, the way he talks about it. Yes, yeah, yeah, and he actually um, has been quoted as saying that um, lazy curators, <laughs> which we, I think we were guilty of at the Horn too, uh, latched onto that association with kente cloth too readily, yeah. and it became too much of a part of the legend. Yeah. And that was really not what he had in mind at the beginning. And you know, nor was the slave trade, although those became apparent to him too when he saw the finished piece. But it was uh, it was a kind of an afterthought. So, and he doesn't want us to think only about that, um, but to think about all the other ideas that he had in making the pieces. Right. Well, it makes me sort of realize how much, as an art viewer, uh, I'm projecting my own ideas into that. Uh, well, we all do that, and that's okay. I mean, he said too. He said about his work that 
you know, the viewer is also very much a part of the work, just like the curators and the preparators are part of it in deciding how to install it. You know, so it's an ongoing process. It's not a finished finite thing, yeah. So maybe with uh, Julianne, do you wanna take sure. a question from other people? We do have people in the Oak Room that I welcome. If you wanna ask a question, I have a microphone set up. Um, Richard Petway, if you'll go ahead. Um, I wanna uh, include another, another accolade. Um, Richard, can you speak close to your microphone? Okay, sorry, sorry. Is that better now? Um, Not I really. Wanted to, uh, give another accolade uh, to Nagy because Dr. Nagy, because um, as, as a docent myself and a docent emeritus, I really appreciate the continued research uh, that she's done on <laughs> this and other African subjects. You can really see uh, if you compare the early lectures we received as docents during the early stages of trying to prepare uh, for uh, presentations and then compare it to your wealth of additional information over time. And, you know, one of the greatest things about retirement, if you continue <laughs> on about uh, the research is a really good thing. And that's the accolade I wanted to bestow yeah. on you because uh, this is, a really impressive lecture that shows your depth of uh, love for this uh, uh, particular artist and his products, but it also enriches to uh, uh, the old time history of, I, I, I must have heard you speak about this maybe five times and each one is better, but this is mm -hmm. probably the be best by far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. It's true, being retired, and I know many of you could attest to this, we're, we're busier than ever, but uh, we get to pick, you know, the things we want to do and be involved in, and I love this opportunity to delve back into Ellen Otsui's work. It was really fun and rewarding for me, too. Julianne, who's next? Yes, uh, Anne-Marie, go ahead, and then I have Roy Hunt, who's going to ask a question. Ah, thank you, Julianne. Um, I really appreciated this lecture um, because I think maybe for the first time I really understood um, several things about a, a particular artist's work that I hadn't put together in quite in quite as effective a manner. And that is um, that you provide um, great context for the artist's work. Um, you know how he came to. Um, understand, for example, the whole um, question about Kintercloth and so forth. So we, we have that backstory. And also, um, and for me, this has always been a problem, understanding how people choose materials to work with mm -hmm. for art mm -hmm. and how that evolves over time. Um, so that was one observation. Another observation I had, and I, I do have a question buried in this one, he seems very charitable about um, mm. how uh, not only curators set up his work, uh, install it, but also um, how you interpret it. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering, I'm, you know, I'm not that familiar with art, but it seems to me he may be more open to um, how the viewer interprets mm -hmm. a particular um, piece, of piece of art. And I think uh, what seems to come across is this whole idea of, um, transforming the materials um, because you've inherited something economically or politically from another culture and as a colonial occupied uh, territory, you make meaning with it, you imbue culture, uh, it, it uh, takes over. I'm wondering, and here's my question, um, I was really struck by the look of the mask of humankind, I think it was, and yeah, I wonder yeah. Yeah, if yeah. you, you can spec, if you know what he thinks about this one, if there's a, a, a backstory there, or if you could speculate on what he what he what he says to you, I don't know what he what he says about it. I mean, to me, that's just um, a perfect example of how he's experimenting with you know this different way of shaping the metal piece into these little rosettes and um, putting them together very you know, sewing them together very tightly so that they, they create this dense fabric instead of a looser or more transparent one. And then um, 
whoever installed it there, um, just bunching it up really, really densely. Um, and what it makes me think of, you know, even though Susan Fogel would say it's not a cloth sculpture anymore, it's not, it's definitely not a reference to kente cloth. We can be sure of that. They don't look anything like that. But to me, it evokes um, Baroque drapery. You know, so, so if you think of, um, or even late medieval and, and Renaissance and Baroque artists when they would do a sculpture or a painting and they would just pile up the drapery in voluptuous folds all around the feet of the figure. You couldn't possibly walk in a garment like that, but they just loved all that mass of folded drapery. And, and it's just to me like, like that, it's just luscious. It's, it's evocative of art history, but not in a specific way. And um, I should say something about the color there. Um, he, he started using some other materials. So now he's getting not only liquor bottle tops, but also tops from um, soda and um, olive oil bottles and, and other kinds of bottles because they have different colors. So he's um, broadened his color palette beyond what you could get from liquor bottles. And he's even using, um, they use a lot of metal roofing in, in uh, West Africa. And he's um, getting roofing tiles and cutting them up into pieces. So um, really continuing that experimentation with different materials to broaden his color palette as well. Um, there's another article I haven't had a chance to read yet um, by a, a curator at the National Museum of African Art, Kira Milbourne. And she's um, interpreting um, Elle's work as being very, not only about transcendence, well, transformation from one form to another, but even, even transcendence from uh, dealing with very mundane materials to transcend that into something that's almost spiritual or you know, mm -hmm. deeply moving on a psychological level. Um, so if, if, you're, it, you know, if anybody really wants to read more about Elle, I would start with Susan Fogel's book, but in her very large book, in very tiny type, she has eight pages of bibliography of articles and books about Ella Natsui. So you, you could find all kinds of things, but if you're interested in that idea of transcendence, um, look for Karen Milbourne's article, which is listed in that bibliography. Is it like the city of Melbourne? M-I-L-B-O-U-R-N-E, I believe, Milbourne, yeah, rather than Melbourne. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I think you said Roy Hunt. Yeah, I did have Roy, but he had to he had to run. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I want to say hello. Well, I hello, Margaret. I I just uh, as you know, I have been a lover of uh, of this work since day one, and uh, was so excited to see it in France when I was there, and I think I wrote you enthusiastically. Yes. Wow. <laughs> you so. Did. Uh, Today was absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much for this. Uh, you've always explained things so beautifully. And uh, mm -hmm. in retirement, you have gotten even better. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the invitation, Margaret. As I say, I really got a lot out of the preparation and sharing it with everybody. It's been really fun. Well, we're thrilled that you were able to join us, really. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you. Well, I don't see any other questions. So, um, Annalise, Laura, Annalise, Anna. Oh, hi, Annalise. Hi, Rebecca. I'm so glad you showed one of the beautiful and uh, creative faces of Africa. Because usually, when you hear about Africa, it's always misery and negatives and wars and, and diseases. And there's so much else going on, which is wonderful. And art is just one of them. Yes, thank you. Thank Annalise. you so much for coming. Thank you. And you're very welcome. OK, any other final comments, Laura? No, I just wanted to <laughs> thank you, Rebecca, so much. <laughs> you're welcome. It's so good to see you. Person next time. <laughs> I hope to see you all in person sometime soon. I'll let you know when I'm in town, Laura. <laughs> okay. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Stay well. Wait to show her our cat as she stays on there.